Muy buenas tardes a todas y Good afternoon, todos. everyone. We welcome to this uh, webinar on early warning systems. I would like to make a couple of announcements before starting this webinar. We have interpretation to Portuguese and English. Please select the language you wish. We also have the option of receiving questions from the audience. And for that, you can make use of the Q&A button. You can um, ask your questions and we will make everything at our hand in order to respond to them. You can make use of the chat to greet each other, but please ask your questions using the Q&A section. I would also like to introduce Manuela Di Gropello. She's the manager of education here in the World Bank to start this webinar. Thank you very much, Ariel. I will be quite brief because I think that everyone wants to go straight to the presentations and not me. Well, on my side, I would like to welcome you all. Thank you all for your participation in this webinar. I would like to highlight that this is the first webinar in a series that we just launched with the dialogue on the recovery of scholarization and learning in Latin America. This new series uh, proposes uh, or wants to create opportunities in order to share experiences and best practices among countries on subjects that are really important in the current context. Um, talking about the current context, we know Latin America has suffered or is suffering a lot from the impact of this pandemic on the education sector. Schools have been closed uh, for a long time. Several countries have started opening some schools, but reopening has been too gradual. Uh, and what we've seen is that there is evidence that indicates that learning is decreasing. There are statistics from the World Bank that show that the proportion of youngsters under the minimum level of competence would be increasing from 50 to 70%. There are some other statistics that show that scholarization years, learning are decreasing in the past year. So we do have statistics that are truly concerning. Not only we fear it, we will see reductions in the learning process, but also um, some other problems, and there are some other statistics and data that we've uh, produced recently that show, for instance, uh, the search that could be uh, increased in at least 10%. And this also shows that one in four students seem are just not uh, taking part in any learning process. In order to summarize, we are in a difficult context. There are schools opening gradually and results in terms of learning and school abandonment that are concerning. So what can we do? All countries need to act. 
urgently and there are different uh, issues we keep opening we need to keep opening schools in a safe and effective manner we need to identify students that are at risk of not returning to school or perhaps living or deserting school so uh, we need to identify all these uh, students who are in a situation of risk and then we need to assess all this and um, actually um, apply remedies as far as we can in order to go back to recover um, the level. This is a broad challenge that um, it's part of the whole context that we live now with regard to the webinar. What we will be discussing are the early warning systems that several countries have already designed and implemented in order to identify the youngsters in a situation of risk. We need to identify them and start focusing our efforts on them in order to help them to go back to school and return to school. So from this perspective, we are quite pleased we want to listen to your experiences uh, in different countries, particularly Brazil, Peru, Chile, Mexico, who have introduced all these systems. Uh, without further ado, I would like to get the floor back to Ariel. I'm sorry if uh, it took longer than expected, but I would like to welcome you all to this series. We're really glad to listen to this experience. Thank you, Manuela. And in fact, we have a great panel of representatives from four ministries that have been innovating and introducing reforms and changes and innovations in the early warning systems. Um, I would like to ask the four panel members to switch on their cameras. I would like to introduce you. First of all, we will have uh, Raimundo Larraín, who is the boss in the Ministry of Education in Chile. Is Raimundo? Hello. There you have your camera on. We can see you. And after Raimundo, we will have Claudia Paola Lisboa Vasquez, who's the leader of the statistics unit in the following unit and strategic assessment of the Ministry of Education from Peru. So, hello, Claudia. Then we will have Miriam Sartori, the Director of Policies and Directives of Basic Education, the Ministry of Education in Brazil. And then we will have Ricardo Ribon, who is the advisor in the unit of educational services from the state of Querétaro in Mexico. Good afternoon, Ricardo. So each one of them will take some minutes to get a brief introduction, and we will use the rest of time in order to discuss about all these subjects that we have on the table and answer to questions from the audience. Without further ado, Raimundo, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Ariel, and the whole team for this invitation. I would like to introduce myself. I am Raimundo Rail. I'm a professor and leader of the general education uh, department in education in Chile. And Adrian, the subject of the issue that brought us here, I would like to share with you the early warning system that as the Ministry of Education we designed when the pandemic arrived and what we aim at is detecting and raising early warning on uh, all students that have greater risk of um, desertion. I would like to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. So I would like to share my screen so that the presentation 
is more effective. The first thing I would like to mention is the context. I think we all share this in the whole region of Latin America. But before the pandemic, we had 186,000 kids and youngsters outside of our school system. That's an important number because we have around three to 3.5 million students in schools. So when the pandemic started, there was uh, classes uh, were stopped for a year and a half, and we analyzed that this number of dropouts would increase up to 40% uh, of students outside of the school system. We also raised data on the same school from, from schools themselves in order to get to know how much of the total percentage of students uh, new, uh, well, the level of participation of groups of students, and we had 7% students that we, uh, and we didn't receive any news from their participation during the year. And we also had the case of students in mid in education, these are 14 to 18 years of age that actually deserted studies in order to support the economic situation at home. So they started working. This data has evolved that this is a world phenomenon. We have an important number of students that due to different, for different reasons, didn't take part in any activities. And we also had students who abandoned school in order to start working. Likewise, uh, this is independent from the pandemic. We also know that there is a factor associated to school desertion, which is the attendance. And in this case, chronic uh, absence. Uh, a kid that uh, misses three to four days in the first uh, term of school, it has twice or three times the risk of um, abandoning school. So uh, it's important to raise these alerts and time uh, in order to monitor these students. A pandemic also hit one of the most important parts in terms of uh, absenteeism, which is not attending to school physically. And in Chile, interruption of presential classes lasted to some school for a year and a half, and some schools even almost two years and the impact it's gigantic in this regard we identified and created a tool in order to support schools uh, this should be a data management tool in order to see what was happening with each student and being able to uh, take care of them timely. And uh, for this, it's not enough uh, to have knowledge of the academic situation of uh, students, such as attendance, their performance, uh, but uh, different costs, due to the different causes, we need to combine this with other factors. For instance, the work situation in the family, the education level of parents and the context where different uh, students live. And all this affects the scenario of uh, school desertion. So that's why in order to face all these challenges, it's important to have a system to detect students who are at risk of deserting in order to support the decision-making process from schools in order to prevent school desertion. In this regard, we created this early warning system and in general terms, this is a system to generate and manage information which we started to implement uh, for students from seventh to fourth uh, grade in high school. So it's the students 13 years of age up to 18. This early warning system allows us to visualize each student at risk of desertion in a simple and optimal manner. Specifically, the early warning system detects and allows uh, the anticipation and support of the local management of schools with the generation of data. 
the specific goals of this early warning system. It's delivering timely information that allows the directives to prioritize students according to the probability of desertion. And it also gives feedback to the management and allows better decision making at different levels of the education system. I would like to explain further how this operates. The early warning system, basically it's an algorithm that it's prepared with the Ministry of Social Development. And this combines a series of factors of administrative nature and different dimensions. For instance, the educational level of each student, if they are part of the, if they are covered by the, um, uh, protection systems of the state, information, uh, different data that uh, uh, combine to different uh, levels individually, family, and as a community. And this all allows to generate a list of uh, students which are identified and prioritized individually. And this way, we get to know who of those uh, students are at risk uh, or, uh, of uh, desertion, school desertion. This information includes inf personal data from students and it's only available to the directors of schools and data is safeguarded and the confidentiality of data is kept safe. But this is a simple platform for directors to use. They accept the confidentiality conditions. Here you have a specific example of how many students are detected per school. So this is organized in a priority level the, with the highest priority to list priority, each student with their names and last names and information so that you can download per student this uh, uh, dashboard that gives you information about the students. You can get to know the historic attendance rate of students, the vulnerability index at family level, and all, some other information that come from different dimensions that allow us to have a landscape of that student. This way, the directors in charge of this are able to update and be informed about the situation of each students and plan actions which is the most important part. For instance, you can monitor if these students have been contacted by the school, if they have been diagnosed, if they have received any visit at home, if that student has uh, retired from school or, or withdrawn from school. So this way you can do follow up to each student and you are able to get to know about the reasons why they're these students are participating in the school or not. So all this information is available to different directors and this allows the schools to develop different actions. For instance, and first, uh, they can have specific information at uh, each student level. And that's important because it renders visible each student and they are not talking about numbers or averages, but each student has their own information or data. Once students have been identified, we can plan and execute concrete actions in order to reconnect this and report actions at school level in order to do follow up to the students that are at greater risk of deserting school. The implementation of this early warning system started in the second part of last year, and we had more than 30% of Chilean schools using the system. And we were able to detect around 670 5,000 students at risk of desertion. This is important because for this group of students, we were able to plan a series of strategies from school. For instance, uh, um, this is uh, curriculum adaptation so that students would not miss that a year at school at the sets of school books and food. With information per individual, we were able to provide a adapted response and the use of a platform. This nature offers certain challenges on one hand, 
This strengthens certain digital competencies. For some directors, it's hard to have access to the platform, so we need to keep conceiving on how we can teach in the use of this platform and make it as accessible as possible for schools. Secondly, an important challenge is to do the follow-up of students. It's If we have an initial picture, it's useless if we do not do follow up to the plans to support uh, support plans from the schools to each students. And this is information from the school. This doesn't need to be reported to the ministries. This is not mandatory. But it's important that we, in order to re incorporate students, we need to do follow up to this information. So the algorithm, it's updated around three to four times a year. And this allows to see how students uh, change and those who have greater risk of school desertion. So that's why this is important. And last but not least, something really important, it's that in critical cases, schools end up being insufficient in terms of support and tools they can provide. For that, the strategies from schools are important, incorporating support in order to incorporate these students. Many of these students require support in terms of mental health that sometimes schools are not able to provide for that. It's relevant to do alliances with health uh, uh, institutions and organizations of the civil society that actually support all these students in their greatest challenges and that go beyond the support that from schools can be offered. This year, we've reprised the uh, classes and 99% of schools have returned to the classrooms and this early warning system, it's focused on this progressive return to presential classes and this has decreased the volume and the number of students detected by the system, but we hope this tool actually continues moving forward because it offers great quality of data. And their purpose, uh, the main purpose that this tool has uh, offered is to keep alive and recover the contact and the link with each student in order to motivate them and continue with their education process. And the message is clear, it's never late to go back to school. So we face some challenges, which is broaden this early warning system to particular education and for kids in primary education, even though we don't have data that allows us to predict a school desertion in this group of students, but we are um, generating a second version of this algorithm, thinking uh, in post-pandemic times in order to detect this uh, uh, primary education students uh, to apply the system to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raimundo. Thank you for your great presentation. Now, I would like to invite Claudia to turn her camera on. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ariel, and all the panel for the invitation to this panel in order to discuss such a relevant issue in this context. I would like to share my screen. Could you please confirm if you can see my screen? Well, in order to continue with the experience presented by Raimundo from Chile, I would like to use this presentation just to guide the ideas I would like to share with you on the experience we've lived in Peru by using early warning systems in order to prevent school desertion. And in terms of the context, the context in which this was created is not different from the one Raimondo presented in the Chilean case. But first of all, we had indicators that were linked to the main factors behind 
is called desertion, that we're becoming more critical, for instance, the context of students, economic factors, unemployment, uh, ramping up, there was increasing poverty, 10% of points in Peru, absenteeism in schools, schools were closed uh, physically, attendance uh, or attending physically to classroom was not possible in the context of pandemic, so we were in a complete lockdown from March 16 up to June, and then uh, we school would start in 2020 so the whole year would um, uh, start a remote education and uh, in Peru remote learning 2021 unfortunately schools continued well some of them are returning to their classrooms uh, but this was not a massive uh, happening. So the first point is the how critical some aspects became behind school abandonment, poverty, economic indicators were getting worse, absenteeism, which is part of which was a result of the lockdown in the country, and we also noticed since 2019, 2020, there was evidence which was quite accurate in the United States, Guatemala and Honduras, how early warning systems actually helped prevent uh, school absenteeism and school um, abandonment or, and deficiency of expenditure as well. So between one to four percentage points in the ex ex experiences. And last but not least, something quite important and that we've been experiencing since our office and strategic follow-up and from the statistic unit where we have a team in that office which is called OCE. Sorry to interrupt you. Could you please uh, change to full screen mode that way it can be seen better. Perhaps camera I can oh sure I had um... could you please confirm if you can see it in full screen mode yes thank you that's easier now well the third point which was quite relevant is that from the strategic follow-up office, which is part of the statistic unit I am leading in the Ministry of Education, there was a team that was working on this data mining, advanced analytic, machine learning methodologies, microdata, in order to project variables that are relevant to education. So there was this modeling, uh, which was predictive of school, um, abandonment and, and this or school ab absenteeism and this became interesting within the framework of COVID and there was there were indicators that said that absenteeism and school desertion would increase and we had this predictive model that was already operating but we didn't know how to set values it was a desktop work from a gym in an office and how could we um analyze this so we united this we we joined we this with the early warning system and the predictions and exploiting all this information from primary school and secondary school students students from 7 to 17 years of age in basic education in peru so how we set values since we had the predictions we used this early warning system that we designed in 2020 but the predictions were done from 2019 so this is the context in which this was created we had desertion rates and primary occasion of approximately 1.5 percent in the past five years before prior to the pandemic and secondary education it was higher 3.5 percent desertion rates and predictions uh, were uh, indicating higher indicators uh, between 2019, 2020, and 2021 desertion rates did not increase that much. And perhaps it has to do with the strategy that we implemented from the um, system alert uh, 
Escuela, which is the system we implemented in Peru, and that's how we contributed to this situation. So in general terms of this tool and what it does, first of all, Alerta Escuela is the name. This is a strategy that was launched nationwide for students in basic education. Uh, uh, we regulate this. Uh, that's, uh, that goes from seven to 17 years of age. And this is an early warning system that actually prevents the interruption of studies or school desertion. And this is addressed to directors of public and private schools in primary and secondary education, basic education from seven to 17 years of age students. And what this provides uh, is three things. First, we have this traffic light code in which each director of different schools in private and public education, the whole educational system, it's 6.5 students, uh, approximately in basic uh, education. So we offer all the directors of these schools who are, who are in charge of managing schools, we give them some sort of traffic light code of each student according to uh, the predictions that we get on the algorithm that it's processed internally in the office of strategic follow-up. Um, we use all this information at student level, all the information that we have, it's income at their homes, it can, uh, um, uh, academic uh, performance of the students, uh, uh, poverty indexes, if these are families that... Uh, are part of uh, different programs and the district conditions, violence, and so uh, and some other information. So all this information is processed in these 6.5 students, 6.5 million students, and with the machine learning and advanced analytics, we predict uh, uh, school desertion. So with that, we get we categorize orange, yellow, and green. Coats, the orange ones are at greatest risk of abandonment or desertion, and the green ones, it's the the, the, small, the, the, the least risk. And this information is shared with the, student, with the professors or tutors in order to start creating strategies. Likewise, as I mentioned, we share this with the same system, some guidance and pedagogic uh, uh, actions on what can be done with these students, for instance. It is messages such as if the student is an orange category, you have this set this toolbox and the actions that with the actions that you can implement at pedagogic level, or you can call their parents and offer tutoring, things that can be done from school. And the third point, this allows to register the directors. Uh, they get information at level of these uh, 6.5 million students. It's information about the students, information they handle on the degree of communication and access they have to strateg pedagogic strategies. So all this, it's what Alerta Escuela offers. This is updated on a monthly basis. There are indicators that may change and students that can be incorporated. And if they were not predicted before, they may be in the future and so on. So who has access to this information? There is access to the, from different levels, at level of directors, tutors, or teachers, at level of educational institutions. They have access to implement this at the education level and intermediate instances that are between the Ministry of Education and the school in Peru. They are called DRED, which is Education Directorates, or local educational units and there is a person who has access to this information at school level due to protect uh, um, data so at school level they are able to know which schools have a greater number of students at greater risk in order to determine the support and actions that can be implemented to help them in this cycle started in 2018. We were expecting information at student level from 2018 and 2019. We got the first results in 2020. We launched this in October 2020. The first version of Alerta Escuela in 2021 was a relaunching. We incorporated 
the school year rules in order to institutionalize this tool. And this was incorporated in the National Plan of Emergency or Health Emergency, I don't, Education Emergency, which is where we work out. We did some campaigns of text in order to promote the use of this tool. So at result level, 30% of directors nationwide in one year of implementation of this tool had access to this or access this platform, 428,279 students in 2020, 6.5 million students between primary and secondary education that were at risk in 2020 of interrupting their studies. In 2021, 90 per, almost 90% had continued studying. Obviously, this, not, this is not a causal study. We didn't do an impact and assessment, but we are able to say that there is some relationship and this has contributed using this early warning system has contributed with this number and the information from Alerta Escuela has helped to uh, approach these interventions at pedagogic level and with tutorship, school enforcement, and all, all different actions on these 428,000 students in order to avoid the desert school. Finally, in terms of strengths and challenges, we've run uh, different assessments, impact uh, relations in the communication campaign that we have used in order to promote its use. And we found interesting results, but also challenges. 60% of directors that were in Viewed in this sample, perceive this to as too simple, didactic. They've we've used text messages for monitoring, and we found that these are really effective in order to simulate the use of this tool. And finally, uh, strength it's the institutionalization of this tool because this has been included in national strategies and plans and general resolutions that generally are visible for the personnel of schools and all, all this brings challenges on one hand and as a result of the assessment of the design and implementation that has been done by our office with external consultants we have the challenge of improving the guidelines that are offered with this tool make it more straightforward and didactic and we're working on this so that in 2022 we have an enhancement plan so that we relaunch this in March we need to increase the training for the proper use of Alerta Escuela, the lack of connectivity, it's a huge challenge. But here we want to um, um, get support for intermediate instances in order to provide this information in case of connectivity problem and also the need of including a pedagogic spe specialist in the team to support of UHEL, the UHEL team, which is local uh, directorate, it visualizes information as an aggregated manner, but there is a person with a pedagogic profile can orient uh, on the actions that can be implemented from schools when they do not know what to do despite the guidelines and the support they've received with this tool. So this is what I wanted to share with you uh, and the experience that we've had. And this is here to say, this is a system that has been institutionalized. There are many challenges in order to increase the use, but we're working on it. Thank you very much, Ariel, for this opportunity. Thank you, Claudia. And we will go back. It's really interesting because we have some similar data from different countries. I would like to go to Miriam, the case of Brazil. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm trying to switch on my camera, but it seems I'm no longer allowed to. It seems it's been blocked. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Ariel. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to talk a little bit about Brazil's experience. This is a pilot program. I'll be showing you my screen in a few seconds. There we go. This is a pilot project. We began just a few months ago at the end of 2021, and we expect to have it up and running at the different schools starting next year. This is a federal government program conducted in partnership with multiple institutions, such as the World Bank and federal universities across Brazil, as well as educational networks. 
in Brazil, our educational system is highly decentralized in basic education. So we rely heavily on educational networks to put these programs into practice. The early warning system in Brazil is part of the Brasil na Escola program, Brazil in Schools program. This is a program devoted specifically for the lower secondary education uh, students uh, 11 years old and above, and will also be including higher uh, secondary education uh, as well next year. There are multiple learning strategies, and this one specifically is a strategy designed to keep students in school. Uh, these are a few figures showing the importance of having strategies like this one in place. Even prior to the pandemic, the school dropout rate was a big problem for Brazil already. Out of every 100 students who begin uh, primary education, only 78 uh, complete high school. So as part of... Uh, basic education, we have a significant number of students who drop out over the course of their studies. That was already a problem in Brazil before the pandemic. Many of the strategies in Brazil look to reducing dropout rates and focus on students once students have already dropped out, dropped out of school. So we have a few other initiatives uh, that get in touch with students and try to bring them back into the school network once the students have already dropped out. Uh, one of the early warning systems advantages is to actually be ahead of uh, the game and uh, prevent students from dropping out in the first place. This is what the system looks like for Brazil. There are five main stages. First is where we map the risks. This is conducted based on a questionnaire. Uh, we print those out and have the students fill them out. Some of the questions are filled out by the, by the schools, not the students. One of the main challenges we face is access to data, because like I said, schooling in Brazil is decentralized. So one of the major challenges we face here in the country is to gain access to all of the necessary data. We're not working with algorithms at the moment. This is just a questionnaire def des designed based on correlations, uh, certain factors actually that are correlated to school dropouts, for example, socioeconomic standing, uh, support network for the students, school trajectory, involvement with drug addiction, with violence. These are all factors that are uh, correlated with uh, students dropping out of school. So this questionnaire was designed based on these studies, as well as a few other sources. Once the mapping is complete, the results are then sent to the different schools. So there's a feedback mechanism here in play as well. That way we get a qualitative, a better qualitative understanding of what the factors of risk are for the different students. We have different levels of access to this data for principals, for students, for uh, managers, and those of us working at the federal level as well. We've been really careful with uh, the data, of course, because there's a law in place in Brazil which uh, makes sure this data is protected. Once the feedback is provided to the schools, we go into stage three. This is follow-up. This is when the student actually, well, this is when the students will undergo specific routines that are custom-tailored to their journeys, depending on the risk factors that they're exposed to. These can be at the school, or there may also be services provided to these students outside the school's premises in the case of extreme risk conditions. Number four is exactly that. That's when there's a situation involving sexual violence, for example, or pregnancy. These are situations where 
the network and the system for protecting children and adolescents have to come in and start working with the individuals. We also have number five here, which is when we revise and make adjustments to the model. That's when we recalibrate the factors as needed, as well as the questionnaires. And that's also when we uh, put together the strategies. The different uh, teaching institutions can uh, do enjoy a certain level of flexibility when putting these models into place. Because of Brazil's size, we have over 49 million students and about 180,000 different schools. So it's a, it's a huge number of students and significant regional region uh, differences. Uh, we need to take these differences and inequalities into account whenever we try to put one of these models into practice. Uh, I'd like to talk to you in, to, in a bit more detail about each one of these steps. Number one, the questionnaire. It's composed of two parts. One is for students and the other is for the school to fill out. So it's a one-page questionnaire. So based on uh, our review, we get information, for example, such as uh, the context about the student, whether he or she resides at home, also the student's engagement, engagement of the family, uh, health and social emotional status, uh, school attendance, school trajectory, meaning whether the student has ever uh, repeated any years, any failed, ever failed any years, whether the student has ever dropped out or engaged in truancy, uh, and also other factors such as involvement with drugs, sexual violence, pregnancy, uh, being homeless. The fact that any of these factors exist will be uh, uh, an indication of risk and will trigger an alert. For the pilot program, we used this particular questionnaire you see right here. It could be downloaded from the internet and filled out uh, by hand. And starting in 22, we'll also be putting in place a platform, which is the same platform which we'll, we'll be using to monitor each student's learning path. Uh, that same platform will also be used as of next year for mapping the risks of these students. Once we have information from all over the country available to us, we will use that information to calibrate and fine tune the instruments we use to acquire the data. Uh, number two, this is the feedback to the schools. And uh, the information is presented in the form of graphs in the discussion with the school team. When we move to the platform, feedback will take place in two ways. First, uh, detailed uh, section of the platform where we can see each student's response to each item of the questionnaire. Only the school has access to this identifying information because of our general uh, personal information protection law. Um, we also have a general type of feedback we also provide, which is a snapshot of the, a snapshot of the entire school or of an entire group. Right now, we don't yet have algorithms in place for this data. We need to calibrate the instrument further and collect even more data. This is why we're using these two levels of feedback we provide to the schools. There's a group, for example, where uh, if any of the high-risk factors is present, the students will go into group one. That means that the student has to monitor the group one students more closely and these students most likely will also have to be engaged outside the school. So any students uh, showing or presenting any risk factors will need to be monitored by the school periodically. I've actually mentioned some of these uh, factors on the other side of the slide to the right. There's another group, group two, which is students where other risk factors have been mapped, not related to violence. And group three, this is students without any risk factors according to the mapping. Uh, number three is follow-up. This can be done in the form of meetings or interviews. These are structured interviews conducted with the students. Um, these are also these also involve conversations with the students, uh, with the teachers, with the family. 
Uh, also, follow-up forms, the platform includes these forms enabling each and every student to be monitored individually, as well as a list or a history of all of the services provided. We also have uh, material for students, or actually for professionals who will be working in this type of service, and also the possibility of engaging students in activities, in extracurricular activities. Uh, extracurricular activities they include a protection network. This is the social workers council. It could also include the legal system, the health and social assistance system could be brought in in high risk cases, for example, especially when some of the factors I showed earlier are involved, such as violence, sexual violence. In that case, there's a lot of secrecy involved. Uh, number five, revision and continuous analysis of the model. That's when we review and fine-tune the questionnaires. We exchange good practices with the objective of further enhancing this model as proposed. And also to uh, adapt some of the strategies to uh, regional contexts. Uh, we have an entire governance chain here, starting at the federal level. This is us here at the Council of Education, but we also have people working at the municipal and state level education secretariats, the coordinators of the Brazilian Escola program, as well as the teams working at the schools. They're all also heavily involved in the process. These are some of the weaknesses and strengths. As for the strengths, uh, well, it's comprehensiveness, right? This is a school that, uh, program that's been, been made available to all schools in Brazil. This program is being uh, uh, run by Concept and Undimi. Uh, the questionnaires can also be flexible and can be adapted to each situation as well as the consequences. We can have regional discussions uh, based on that and also fine tune the instruments to each regional reality. Um, also, we can uh, process the data and use that data to monitor students very closely. And of course, the platform can be used free of charge by the schools. Also, financial support to the schools. Some of the schools working with vulnerable populations will get uh, financial support from the federal government when implementing this particular project. We also provide training and courses. Um, and we also have a uh, dropout prevention culture. We think a lot about the causes that lead students to drop out of school. Challenges, well, the questionnaire has to be calibrated, uh, the feedback has to be precise. Uh, mapping the students by risk level is still a big challenge. Also coordination between the school and the support network. Now, since we're using a platform, connectivity is also a challenge. Uh, the pandemic has unveiled this particular challenge in all of Brazil. We need to make sure that all schools and teachers and students are connected, are online. Also, teacher training, um, staff available for individual monitoring of students. We know that we need properly trained individuals and professionals to address certain types of situations. Also, uh, impact assessments. so that we can check to see whether the policy or the program is indeed successful in reducing dropout rates. Next up is restriction and careful use of data, non-labeling of students, and including regional specificities given Brazil's huge size. It's a country nearly the size of a continent. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation and uh, I'm here if you have any questions. Ricardo to tell us about his experience uh, of Queretaro. Hi, good afternoon. There are three slides. Could you please project them or share them? This is the presentation. The title is important, Recovering and Scholar 18 Learning After COVID-19, uh, after experiencing the pandemics. Understanding that the pandemic 
still has this in uncertainty, um, less and less, but even though that's the case, we need to be alert. Second slide, the information from Uzbek. We would like to talk in contracts with uh, presentations that we've heard. It's an education system which is regional, subnational. And we have national guidelines. And we also have the possibility of making decisions and doing adjustments at this level, sub, at subnational level. The character state, it's a small state. It's towards the center of Mexico. And we have around 380,000 students from 13, from three to 14 years of age. They are almost 50%, well, 50.3% female, 49.7 male. We have 17,000 teachers and 2,070 schools. The context of the pandemic in Mexico, the first case happened in February 2020. In March, we uh, locked uh, down all school centers and August 2021, the system and subsystem of basic education in Querétaro, we started the process of opening schools. So it is 17 months that schools were closed in Mexico. Given the social inequality, the consequences that we are diagnosing are quite deep and they differentiate depending on the social group and the response capacity that the group, the social group has along with the design of programs and public policies. Mexico in general terms, there are 126 million inhabitants and not due to pandemic, but before that from 2018 to 2021, the population at poverty level went from 51.1 million to 55 million. So it's 3.8 more, uh, 3.5 million more poor. And next slide. The effects of the pandemic in basic education, public basic education in Carretera State, we had school desertion of 12%, meaning almost 45,000 students did not enroll in the school year 2020-2021. There are uh, emotional and physical health problems, obesity, and social isolation that has led to an alteration of the conduct um, uh, problems, there are learning issues, deficiencies in this process of uh, language learning has uh, been more acute, sciences and some others. The social inequality at national level also happened happens in Querétaro, when more than 50% of students are low income uh, without access to internet, and uh, parents with low levels of education. This all has had an impact on education, income, health, and food conditions. And schools have been damaged during their lockdown. They were vandalized with robberies and deterioration and almost abandonment since there was no personal in order to uh, keep them uh, to, to, to uh, for maintenance, uh, to perform maintenance tasks. In 2021, the education services unit for basic education in character state, among other things, uh, tried to guarantee better health conditions for the 
safe uh, return and indignity of students to their schools, solve uh, connectivity problems and uh, computer equipment, assess uh, the learning in order to identify the origin of main problems, the acquisition of greater languages, mathematics and sciences, and a program to attend to support kids with uh, problems where it was implemented we identified cases of kids who abandoned school due to pandemic and there was a work strategy in order for them to recover their school cycles with their own competences and abilities and also the discipline. This strategy was personalized, was customized in the organizational structure of the services unit from supervisors and directors of schools. And they did a personalized follow up in order to diagnose problem cases and a school abandonment or school desertion in order to after the results of this diagnosis to do follow up and offer support. All this support come from or aim at uh, having schools with the proper support and additional support such as food, uh, scholarships, school um, equipment, among others, the school conditions that we've seen for the 2021 and 2022, we started from a point in which that since we started opening schools three months ago, schools are not a source of infection and this generates uh, an environment of trust so that uh, actions that are implemented considering all the measures that need to be implemented this will help them to um, schools to go back to normal uh, uh, in a better percentage out of these uh, conditions for the 2021 to 2022 school year this in August 2021, we started the return to the class, to the school, and the safe return in a gradual and sustainable manner, and uh, in a sustained manner. And this is a problem that we're trying to solve, and it's in good direction because the message sent by the national government is that this return should be gradual sustained but voluntary so this generated a confusion because this needs to be a voluntary but it needs to be responsible because this education task is not really that flexible in us to allow some returning to schools, uh, to the classrooms, or, and some others not. And the commitment of the government of character state of going back to the classrooms in the better, the best conditions in terms of infrastructure and uh, personnel. In the period of August, December 2021, um, 328 schools returned to their um, facilities uh, out of 2070, and our goal is to recover the learning processes, fostering programs, uh, teachers training, and promoting among parents the importance of accompanying their kids in the education process. More than 90% of professors and teachers and this is an important uh, piece of information that we need to consider. They have at least one dosage of the vaccine and the inf most solid information that we've received from the health services is that we need to complete these uh, dosages. And an important result is uh, our outcome is that uh, after the health measure, uh, that were implemented, there is a low incidence of infection and infection comes from the external circle of schools and when they have been detected, which has happened in some cases, the 
uh, protocols that are deemed necessary have been implemented. So that's what I said. The schools are not the source of infection. This generates some um, reliability levels. The next uh, step that starts in January, and we believe that in April it would be finished is the behavior of the pandemic allows us to forecast a positive uh, uh, landscape for the return of kids to schools in January 2022 we will be we will have 50% of schools and they will meet the requirements set by the health authorities and we also have the the return to schools uh, of personal and skill in February, March, we will reach 100% there. We have uh, schools. The condition that we need to consider is the behavior of the pandemic. This uh, different variables that maybe uh, generate some uncertainty, but as long as we can respect and uh, and apply the protocols, this uncertainty will be greatly reduced. And challenges towards the future, immediate future, is the recovery of learning through virtual and presential schemes and to rescue kids and youngsters who abandon their studies in these times uh, with this strategy that I just mentioned. This is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. We have a series of questions from the audience. I don't think we will be able to answer them all, but to get started, there is something that really caught my attention. And most countries, the degree of use of these early warning systems, Claudia, in the case of Peru, and uh, Raimundo in the case of Chile, you mentioned 30% of schools or directors were using the system. Miriam didn't share the number, but she mentioned as a challenge the use of this system. So, Claudia, is there any thought or idea? Could you please turn on your camera, Miriam, Ricardo, Raimundo? Do you have any comment on this challenge of using the system? Because 30% means that 70% of directors are not using this tool, which is really important in the context of pandemic. So we should expect uh, yeah, I have persons ties that there is awareness on the risk of, of desertion. So what ideas do you have about this? Well, there are different things here. I think um, several things are happening at the same time with this pandemic. First, let's say the connectivity and uh, the technology Knowledge may explain somehow a part of this lack of access. There are some other things that have been trusted to management leaders uh, from schools and many things in the, well, at least in the case of Peru, with offer tablets, with uh, and over materials, and they have to enter this into their systems. And there are many additional responsibilities that have fallen on these leaders of in charge of school management. And this is an additional task. This is something additional, in, and it's not a responsibility of registering this, but it's something that serves their purpose. And But this adds a load to their work they have as teachers, professors, folders of recovery, tablets, they have given uh, context of remote learning, which they have, they have 
had to adapt to that lack of connectivity also and uh, obviously the institutionalization of a system when there are many things to do uh, as part of the school realm this generates a challenge and this is delayed so we have a follow-up system to the school trajectory of the student that was created in 2014 by now we are in 2021 and after five years we are able to say that the system has a great uh, uh ray because there are some things that have uh being put together, uh, for instance, incentives, um, the loyalty, uh, and all this together has fostered, uh, has promoted the uh, coverage of 100%, and they will be, um, they will have to do it. But in the case of Alerta Escuela, we are working on this. We think that if this becomes a rule or, or if this is part, not an incentive, not really an incentive, but perhaps part of some component, uh, this can strengthen this number, perhaps more mass campaigns at communication level on this tool. And the other thing is that the private schools that uh, cover f approximately 25% of the students. They also have internal systems and internal management systems, and some regions uh, have implemented their own systems. This is, let's say this is national, but it doesn't mean that in the regions they may have some of the systems that complement these. So it's a mix of things, but uh, we will keep institutionalizing this tool in every realm we can because we believe in this tool and we truly think that this can complement other initiatives for coming from regions or private schools in their own cases. So thank you. Ricardo, the situation in Querétaro is different than in Peru, but how do you see the limitations that directors face and leaders at school level. So in order to follow up on this um, risks faced by students uh, just searching schools, do you see that you are and conditions or the limitations that Claudia mentioned are more present? What, what can you say about this? So I would say that we share the same situation. The thing at subnational level or regional level is that you detect more detail with more detail the problems. Uh, the, it's it's easier to communicate this organizational structure so that the message is brought directly and the support and accompaniment that it's required also comes. So we believe after all this work we've done with those responsible of schools and directors and supervisors at regional level, we think that we can follow up with this system in in our specific case it's quite um, harsh uh, to make students that did not enroll in the current school year and as you could see 12% it's uh, an important percentage and for that the directors will have the support they require to do so and uh, we would like to to have this discussion that sometimes we forget in education and it's education itself. Why do we want students to go back to their classrooms? That's a traditional offering of the concept of education or is it after all this additional support of connectivity that we pretend to start in January in Querétaro with 97% of schools with connectivity. And uh, we would like to foster the use of some technology so that this connectivity uh, has better quality. But as you know, 
in education, this does not guarantee a better education, nor the fact that students remain in the classroom, but this may be a necessary condition. So if we uh, keep working on these uh, uh, actions and conditions, we may make uh, generate more appealing for students to remain uh, in their schools. Thank you, Ricardo. Raimundo. Similar question, 30% of schools are using the system in Chile and in Peru. What happens with the remaining 70%? What can be done so that the use increases? Well, it's a good question, Ariel. I would say two things. First, an algorithm, this is a new platform, and as every new platform, it requires some adjustment and digital competences that we need to work on. And in this regard, it's relevant to do this training and teach schools about the benefits this provides, because in the end, the best, uh, um, the best outcome comes from the school itself when they do follow up and they get better the best outcome. So the biggest challenge is to demonstrate that this actually works. It's to demonstrate cases of success and the um, opinions and information that come from peers that have implemented this. And we've led regional groups in which directors of that region share that share the geographic context and economic context that are more alike. They get together and they share best practices. That's one thing. And I think without a doubt, something that would make these early warning systems be more appealing is when we involve the youngest kids, youngest students, because that's something we need, because we've implemented this from 13 to 18 years of age, and chronic desertion, it's higher in the primary education and the evaluation in this primary education in Chile. It's a challenge for us because this education is not mandatory. And this, uh, there is a lot to do in order to advance in this kindergarten education. And um, there is an, another subject, which is decision-making based on um, this. And that's something that should be implemented at schools because this allows me to uh, name kids. It's not about an average or data or systems or subventions or anything. This is a parallel system that and we need to generate mechanisms so that life, uh, that schools have an easier way of uh, getting the success they require. So the message uh, shared from by, shared by Claudia on this excess of responsibilities that directors and schools have specifically in times of crisis, I think this is important. I would like to talk about the this warning system, but now let's, we, we talked about it, but how do we apply Miriam, there were some questions um, asked by the audience on these retention strategies on this regard. And um, what strategies that you've, uh, that you have as options uh, have been more effective or more demanded? I know you don't have an impact assessment, but what are your thoughts about this re response strategies to these uh, warnings that have been generated? Well, first and foremost, 
diferenciar o fator de risco das causas. We need to understand the different causes, the different causes from the risk factors. So when we have uh, risk factors, we often identify them, but we don't have the causes. Uh, the strategies put in place by the schools uh, need to rely on the underlying causes that may cause a student to drop out of school. For example, failing a year in school by itself is not a cause of school dropout, but rather a risk factor. The cause could be low engagement, for example, uh, eyesight problems, lack of access to the school, no transportation. There might also be learning problems, uh, school lags, and uh, other issues. So once we've identified and mapped out the risk factors, which are not necessarily, once again, the causes that uh, lead children to drop out of school later on, uh, the school needs to conduct a proper assessment, and follow-up is a big part of this. Uh, the school will need to provide a bit more personalized service uh, to these students. And during that assessment, we'll determine uh, the potential causes that might lead the child to drop out of school, maybe learning uh, challenges or lack of a proper support network. And the school also has strategies at its disposal. Uh, these are some of the many students, uh, many uh, strategies exist. For example, uh, there's a personalized monitoring program uh, that we have. Um, and we look at the possible causes. For example, it's a child that's almost done with elementary school but has not yet learned how to read or write. We know that the likelihood of that student dropping out of school later on in life is much higher because if a student can't read, uh, they won't be able to engage with the school subjects. So once we've identified the cause, then I can propose a proper strategy for that cause. For example, if the problem is school transportation, for example, that case would require logistics and other solutions that may fall outside the jurisdiction of the school. Uh, in the case of early pregnancy, for example, uh, I as a student, as a school, would need to bring in the health system for my city involved in the uh, a strategy. If the teenager who's pregnant is under 14, that may be a crime. So, because it's considered rape in Brazil under 14, so there might be a need to include the police as well. These are all extra school uh, uh, types of support that we can provide. Also, engagement with the family for teen pregnancy cases may be a different type of curriculum uh, that enables. Uh, pregnant adolescents to uh, be involved without necessarily having to go to school in person. So it's basically all about the causes. At the Ministry of Education, what we do is create general flows, if you will, based on the different assets we have available at the national level here in Brazil and provide some guidance, guidance we've acquired from previous programs in Brazil, uh, for example, uh, a minimum income programs, programs that engage with vulnerable populations. We do have a few flows along those lines. And we also promote good practices and the exchange of information across schools in the same network, because we know uh, that these strategies, they are regional to an extent. The schools have to put them in place and have to uh, adapt them to their respective realities, working with their local governments. Thank you very much, and Claudia. Same question. What have you learned about the strategies, retention strategies are more effective responding to the risk information that the early warning system is providing? Well, tutoring and accompaniment to the teachers. Uh, it's um, from the ministry. We should guide them. We should guide the, all the teacher, personnel, tutors, personnel who are there in the classroom with students. And that should translate into tutoring sessions from 
teachers to students in contexts in which the economic context is what has uh, affected us the most. We had two waves that really affected us economically and that led us to this lockdown. The economic part was really affected and these tutoring sessions have been really effective. And for that to uh, happen in the classroom from the ministry, we deployed lots of trainings, webinars, and providing material to teachers on what kind of subjects need to be covered in these tutoring sessions in this context, complex context sessions with parents one on one uh, with the professional personal. It's not only teachers uh, discussing with the students, but also getting closer to the parents has been really important in this context because parents needed the support. And I think Raimundo mentioned that they required support in order to keep their homes afloat. And some of them had been fired. Some of them were really affected in terms of income. So the bigger kids started uh, becoming uh, workers uh, in order to help at home and the accompaniment of the personnel that is close to these uh, students, uh, to the parents, in order to understand what happens uh, because the kid, even though there is this context, they should try to keep studying. And we believe this has been what has helped the most in this context. And I think this is part of the orientation. Uh, 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 we had this traffic light I explained, but we also offer guidelines on tr specific actions to be implemented and how these tutoring sessions should be implemented and what subjects should be covered. And that it's all covered in this uh, tutoring that we're offering and all the trainings we've offered to the teachers and directors in schools through different webinars and materials that we've shared so that they implement this with their parents and students as well. I think that's it. Well, we are, we, we have a few minutes and I have a final question. And it's the same to Ricardo Raimundo. One of the subjects that we're covered here is the coordination with other actors uh, that are not part of the education system, for instance, the health system, the social protection system, or, uh, or the civil society, as Raimundo mentioned. So briefly, because we do not have much time left, the same question for both of you. What lesson uh, have you learned on how to articulate better with other actors that are not part of the education system in this response? Ricardo, the floor is yours. Well, the response, uh, I will try to be as concise as possible. The coordination of different instances of the government, of the private sector, depends a lot on the leadership of the unit of education services in order to coordinate the different tasks that these instances have in order to take care of this because they have all they all have shown interest in attending this because return to classes in an environment of uh, in disaster because situation tends to be tragic if physical facilities and the educational process so the return has been uh, progressive, uh, promise, promising, and in this regard, the leadership from this instance responsible for basic education has the big task of coordinating. And this coordination in Querétaro has been started uh, properly and according to the 
conviction we have from the state uh, um, authority that the state needs to become a mechanism of development and mobility, social mobility. Thank you. And Raimundo, the floor is yours to answer this last question. Coordination lessons learned. Well, there are three specific things. First, it's getting to know the support networks because support networks are very different in each region of the country. There are different foundations, different hospital capacities. There are different services of primary um, primary services. So first, it's mapping the networks, and this needs to be done by each school, not the state, because at central level, I really don't know what the support system from a rural um, location or in the desert or in the Patagonia. So it's important to get to know the support network. Second, and that, that needs to be done locally. Second, it's being able to ask for help. Some schools are uh, closed or locked down and they are waiting for a response from the central uh, authority and there might be issues of uh, justice, mental health. There are students that have been vulnerated in their rights and uh, and it's important to ask for help and to even though this sounds obvious, this is really important because there are some schools that won't go, that they won't follow that. And there should be someone responsible for these articulation actions because if there is no one responsible per school, it, there won't be any monitoring or follow up on all the things that happen with different entities and organizations from the state and civil society. So, getting to know support networks, ask for help as a school, and having someone in charge of activating these supports and monitoring and following them up. Excellent. Well, we run out of time as usual. I would like to keep talking about this and uh, analyzing more results and sharing more experiences. But unfortunately, time uh, is on and the experiences we've heard are quite illustrative on the kinds of innovations that are happening in Latin America. The challenge is huge. We had pre problems prior to the pandemic and this has aggravated. And I think that a challenge that we will be facing in 2022, and we hope that we will be able to live this critical period, it's how we can continue and build on the innovated, on the created, on the changes that have been introduced, some at system level, some from the school's perspective. So I think that being able to learn from one another, getting to know about these experiences, the honesty in which you presented the cases, what you know, what you don't know, and so on. I think that's really uh, uh, something in terms of the collective learning that we have in the region. So thank you very much to the four of you for your ideas, your insights, your experience that we've that you've shared with us. I would like to thank all the participants on behalf of the World Bank and the Inter-American Dialogue, I would like to remind you that this is a series. This is the first event of a series of events that we will be organizing uh, in a joint manner, the two institutions on subjects related to the recovery uh, from the pandemic. Today, we cover the most basic issue, which is having information on the risks faced by kids, and particularly of desertion. But we will be working on the importance and the critical agenda related to the learning. Um, so we expect to be able to communicate with all of you and tell you more about the new agenda or the next seminars, but now 
I wanted to thank you, salute you, and wish you the best in these holidays that we all are able to share uh, more time with our relatives and friends and start the year 2022 uh, in a better context uh, for all of our countries. So uh, thank you very much and see you really soon. Thank you. Best regards to all of you.